the text that I had to read for class was Kokoro by Natsume Soseki. It's a Japanese book and it was translated into English. It was written in 1914, however, it was translated and published in 1957. So there's a little bit of gap there. Uh, the story's main character is Sensei, although at first it appears to be the narrator, and it speaks of the narrator's relationship with Sensei. The longest part of the book is Sensei's Testament, and it's sort of Sensei explaining all the things that he didn't explain to the narrator before. Um, in the beginning of the book, Sensei is very cold and distant, and the narrator is fascinated by this, and keeps coming, and he just really wants to be friends with Sensei. So it's pretty cool. So anyways, the questions I have to do, I have two structuralism ones and two gender-based ones. So the first uh, one for structuralism is using a specific structuralist framework, analyze the text narrative operations. Can you speculate about the relationship between the text and the culture from which the text emerged? In other words, what patterns exist within the text that make it a part of a larger culture? So uh, basically what this means is how does this reflect 1914 Japan, Japan Japanese culture? Um, well, first off, we see the people. So, Sensei's wife was um, very, she was a very strong woman, let me tell you. Uh, she's one of my favorite characters. Um, it says here that the uh, narrator was deeply impressed by her capacity for sympathy and understanding. What also impressed me was the fact that though her ways were not those of an old-fashioned Japanese woman, she had not succumbed to the prevailing fashion of using modern words. In Japan, it went through a sort of punk stage for women, gender revolution, I don't know, but uh, they started becoming more themselves and creating a culture for them in old-time Japan, and like still a bunch of rich people still go through with these. Um, it, they wore kimonos, women were innocent, and they were put up for marriage and stuff like that. You know, Sensei's wife was not quite there, but she wasn't quite here, so it was a cool balance. And he, he was like, I like that she's not too modern, but I like that she's not too old, and it was perfect. Um, another thing, there was a general that committed suicide. General Nogi, which the father says as he's dying, will General Nogi ever forgive me when he's blabbering on about uh, nonsense because he's being delirious and he says he will join Nogi soon. So that's kind of foreshadowing his death. Sad, but whatever. And this leads into the next question, which is what rules or codes of interpretation must be internalized in order to make sense of the text? <sighs> So this is Japanese, and Jap Japanese culture is very different from American culture. Uh, in America, in these times, we were working in sweatshops, and women were trying to make a good amount of money per hour, and people were living in houses that weren't big enough for the 20 people that lived in their apartment buildings, large amount of dirty stuff. But in Japan, you know, they had trains and stuff. They weren't completely not modern, you know, there's trains mentioned in the book, um, but the train rides were expensive. You know, nowadays it costs $5 to, like, go to the next town over. Um, he travels back and forth to see his parents and go back to college. So, um, in Japan, things are generally more thinking, less showing. Um, in America, we tend to show a lot of our emotions and be very forward, but in Japan, it's cultural, um, the cultural differences. You're supposed to not completely show what you're thinking, not completely show yourself, and Sensei seems to bring a lot of that um, in with him, himself. Um, in the book, you know, silence is kind of not an awkward thing, but rather a thing that allows you to reflect on what you said, or I don't want to talk anymore without saying I don't want to talk, and people really uh, are able to grasp these social cues. And I find it really fascinating. It's really cool. Um, another thing is that um, they don't confess love. Um, on page 200, uh, during Sensei's Testament, it says, um, 
during the long period of time that we lived in the same house, there were, of course, many opportunities for me to tell Oji-san directly how I felt towards her, but I purposely ignored them. They have, um, it's not that they have a hard time communicating, it's just that sometimes you don't need to communicate. Of course, you're, if you're going to tell someone, like, I love you, or, like, I like you, or I want to date you, you know, they'll say that, but after that, it's much less shown, and it's not really because of being self-conscious, it's because of the culture. So, moving on to gender, the first question is, what elements of the text can be perceived as being masculine and feminine, and how do the roles of the characters support these traditional roles? So, Sensei's wife, who is my favorite character, seems to show the more powerful side of women, but yet still maintains that weak image that uh, past um, generations have thought of women as. You know, Sensei's wife was her own person, and she was respected by the narrator. And, you know, especially in these times, women weren't really respected. You know, it was controversial that they were trying to get a job at this time. And it, it's just completely phenomenal how strong Sensei's wife appears. Um, and, you know, but she's not exactly active or powerful or masculine she's still feminine you know she's you see her weak side but you also see how smart she is and how strong she is and i think that's a really cool thing and of course uh the masculine part is going to school you know uh the narrator himself is attending college at this time and um he explains that he was a rather simple-minded young man Women, for example, were total strangers to the kind of world I knew or had experienced. True, being a man, I felt an instinctive yearning for women, but the yearning in me was a little more than a vague dream, hardly different from the yearning in one's heart when one sees a lovely cloud in the spring sky. Often, when I find myself face to face with a woman, my longing would suddenly disappear. Instead of being drawn to the woman, I would be, um, I would... I would feel a kind of repulsion. And he explains that this isn't how he feels with Sensei's wife, though. And that she was a different kind of woman. And I really like that. That, you know, still addressing the fact that he's a man and he knows he's drawn to women, but not necessarily intellectually. But Sensei's wife was still capable of having an intellectual conversation. He was completely mind blown by that. And, you know, of course, it is kind of mind-blowing to think, oh my god, all of my life I've been seeing women as, like, weak creatures, and now all of a sudden, bam, knowledge. She was a very um, good character to base that stuff off of. The next question is, how does the author present the text? Is it a traditional narrative? Is it secure and forceful? Or is it more hesitant or even collaborative? So it's saying, is this text more masculine or feminine? Honestly, um, I'd say that it is more on the masculine side. It's focusing on the manly side of things. It's focusing on some strength and trying to overcome hardships that are, like, extremely difficult rather than... Uh, you know, going and trying to make your own path in life, which is what a lot of feminine type texts do, you know, because the basic thought about women is that they can't decide on their own. And though it's a sad thing, that's what society wants us to do. And um, this, this is showing that he's supposed to be a manly guy. He's supposed to do what man's, men do. Like, and it's, and it, it is very traditional. You know, it was written in 1914, but, you know, certain things like with Sensei's wife and, you know, how, how he interacts with Sensei, you know, back in those days, it was not uncommon to interact with somebody who's largely older than you. He was, Sensei was probably pretty old by this time, you know, not too old, but like at least pretty old. He was at, out of college, he was living stably, um, he was pretty much an old guy, and the main character, not the main character, the narrator looks up to him like he's a teacher of some sort, because that's what Sensei means. And I think that's really cool in all, like, traditional in the sense, like, this is how the book starts out. I always called him Sensei. 
I shall therefore refer to him simply as sensei and not by his real name. It is not because I consider it more discreet, but it is because I find it more natural that I do so. Um, and with, with men, especially in Japan, having a teacher was like, that, that was like your second father, basically, you know, you know, they taught you, you know, your father was supposed to be a teacher himself. He was supposed to teach you the ways of the world. And, you know, the narrator, instead of getting these things from, uh, you know, his dad and his mom, it shows how much he's learned from sensei and how much he's learned about sensei and how much sensei has taught him about life. And sensei, 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 his teacher is very important. So I think it's more manly in a sense, rather than womanly. I use both uh, structuralism and um, gender uh, questions in this video, and uh, I have been told to think which one is more useful in uh, criticizing this book and, you know, trying to understand it better. Uh, I honestly think that the structuralism is more effective because I find it very easy to get lost in, you know, how this part is feminine and this part is masculine. But this is a novel. This isn't meant to, you know, embrace women's rights or embrace masculinity. This book was written to show um, the teachings that a sensei gave to a student, in a way. And, I'm going to sneeze. Okay. Okay. And, and um, honestly, structuralism plays a big part in this because the biggest thing we see in writers is about their ingenuity and how far they're willing to step beyond the line in order to make the public go, oh my god, what the heck? And I think that this is what the author is trying to do, so therefore the structuralism, much as I like the gender questions, uh, is more effective in observing the text, you know? How does this uh, relate to society? How does this emulate, you know, what, what culture was at the time and gender sort of is just um, something that was thrown in there you know here and there but not all the way